suggested to you in the first of this series, our Greek mythology did not arise from a single source, but as was usually the case among ancient peoples, the mythological systems gradually amalgamated. They came together as separate culture units became more commonly aware of their relationships and values. Also as remote regions attained civilization and in the course of wars and conquests they gradually assembled an almost incredible diversity of names local names for deities, names for principles observed by man. On the level of observation, his findings were usually similar, if not identical. But because of language barriers and from lack of communication uh, with those of similar interests in other parts of the world, each of these culture groups developed its own names for almost the same ideas and principles. As time went on, uh, most of the smaller groups, the smaller culture groups, united to form the great group of Hellenic culture patterns, which we have come to know as Greece. Even as late as the Roman conquest, however, we cannot say that the Greeks themselves were fully aware of all of their own borrowings. They were not certain that they had exhausted the possibilities of the various peoples that had come under their domination. This, of course, is brought to our attention by the episode at the Areophagus when uh, St. Paul saw the altar to the unknown God. He inquired and learned that a plague had attacked Athens and that offerings had been made to all the gods that the people knew, but the plague continued. So they made an altar to any god whom they had neglected. Immediately, the plague ceased. This indicates that the Greeks had no actual calendar on this uh, problem of deities, and were not sure as to whether some of the similar divinities were identical or not. Thus, after a long period of time, we come upon another complicating episode. And that was the rise of Greek drama. Your Greek dramatists, like your Elizabethan dramatists in England, took some astonishing liberties with mythology, history, and related matters. It was convenient in the plays that persons who had lived at remote times should appear contemporary, so they were brought together. It was important that certain things should happen, therefore deities were held responsible. And in many respects, the dramatists made the distinguishing of the deities not almost, not, all, not all, only difficult, but almost impossible in some instances. Hesiod points out that there were also layers of interpretation. And we have suggested already that some of these layers arose as early as the second millennium BC, probably between the 12th and 15th centuries BC, where already the moving mind of man had outgrown the interpretations he had given to his own gods. It is impossible to hold the human being to interpretations that no longer satisfy his consciousness. He will not worship deities whose codes and actions and conducts are inferior to his own. And as he grew, he began to refine and interpret. 
and among the first refinements that primitive man made, whether it was in Greece or India or in the Polynesians, was to cause a remoteness between himself and his deities. He no longer conceived them as merely a dwelling above or around the next hillside. They were no longer merely separated by a river or a stream, nor did they resemble closely himself or his ancestors. By degrees the deities came to be regarded as solitary, separate, away from the common humanity of things, of an order or kind of their own. And the moment this began to develop as an interpretive move, the next was inevitable, because early, at least not any later than the beginning of the 10th century BC, Egypt and the Etruscans, the Chaldeans and Babylonians, were already embarking in the thrilling adventure of the Sea of Science. Science is not as new as we think. It was cultivated long ago. And the, one of the first attitudes of science always is this search for reality. And primitive scientists were well aware that the mythological accounts familiar in their times could not be literally accepted. They were fully aware that there were explanations for things far more reasonable than the folklore and more susceptible of value to the individual. As a result of this dawning scientific attitude, it became customary to interpret the deities more and more psychologically, to regard them either as physiological or psychological processes in nature. Thus, instead of thinking of them as persons, they came to be thought of as laws, as energies, as fields of power, of archetypal patterns, of uh, mathematical formulas, as Pythagoras reported in his visit to the temples of the Egyptians, where he said the gods were all presented to the priests in the shapes of geometrical solids in order that their esoteric principles might be more easily comprehended. We have already noted that it was unlikely that the age of Pericles, the great age of the rise of Greek literature, philosophy, and science, could have continued generally to accept a literal belief in the ancient folklore of the Greek provinces any more than it would be possible to bind us totally to the concepts and hypotheses of gypsies or to cause us to return again to the primitive attitudes of our ancestors relating to death and immortality, things of that nature. Man does not go backward. He moves forward slowly and with difficulty, but always forward, and in his religion his forward motion is his eternal search for the discovery of principles beneath personalities, legends, lore, myth, and fable. So by the time we are interested in this situation, Greek mythology had already become the language of Greek philosophy. We mentioned in the first lecture that there would be nothing more terrible than to assume the Greek mythology is identical with Greek religion. Such is not the case. Any more than it would be fair to say uh, that Grimm's fairy tales are identical with modern science. Nor should we assume that those who love the story of Cinderella necessarily believe it. Yet when we read Cinderella, there is something believable about it. And this thing that is believable about it is our own internal conviction of the victory of right. It becomes a moral legend, a fable uh, which has to do with the final and ultimate triumph of good over evil, of virtue over conspiracy, of love over hate, of unselfishness 
over selfishness and of purity over corruption. These things are believable. They were believable to the Greeks in their times, in their legends also. So gradually the believing of legend moved from the literal to the moral, to the ethical, to the cultural, perhaps finally to the scientific, philosophical, and ultimately to the spiritual. But always it was a way of unfolding a meaning in things, rather than a plain or simple acceptance of the outer structure of fable or myth. We've already given a brief summary of the creation as it was set forth at least in the time of Hesiod and uh, later unfolded by Pl Plato and Proclus. We might add something, however, to the previous account in order to make it as complete as possible. We know that from the mysterious egg of Fades, which we described, how this egg formed out of the strivings of ether and chaos, finally burst into magnificent light, only ultimately to break open and give birth out of itself to the luminous deity Fades, winged, many-headed, many-armed, that was to be the symbol of the light of creation bursting forth out of the darkness of potential. The shell of the egg of Fades therefore became heaven and earth. Raised upon great and immortal foundations, its upper golden hemisphere became the sky, and its lower silver hemisphere became nature. And thus we had a rise in our myth, the first contrasting of God and nature, of the divine and the mortal, of the eternal and the temporal, and the gradual emergence of these polarities and dualities, which were ultimately to be personified in the Greek legend as Uranus and Gaia. Uranus was heaven, Gaia was earth, and from the union of heaven and earth there came forth a number of strange and wonderful beings, beings that uh, Berossus tells us about in his Chaldean history, but about which we have only legends, such as we find in the Homeric episodes and epics, or in the Arabian Nights, or in the great Bharatas and Puranic literature of India. For of the union of heaven and earth, united by the mysterious power of this ethereal, intangible agent called Eros, love, the first love of heaven and earth brought forth a strange order of beings, or several strange orders of beings, of which the best known to us are the Titans. Now the Titans were twelve in number, and they corresponded in the Greek legend to uh, the Kumara, or the virgin youths of ancient East Indian philosophy. The Titans were not truly of this earth, but as the term has come to su suggest, they were titanic forces, titanic principles. They were the firstborn of the striving of heaven and earth. As the Chinese would say, they were created from the union and commixture of yang and yin. From these two striving principles, all multitudes and diversities having originated. From the union of heaven and earth also were born the Cyclopes. Now I understand we've recently had another motion picture outbreak of Cyclops in the uh, story of Sindad the Sailor, which probably would be a great success, but it has no known resemblance to the Arabian Nights. This uh, story, and the uh, story as told by Homer for that matter, indicates the Cyclops were deities with a single eye. They were usually represented as giants and not always friendly to man. But when you go back into your earliest Greek philosophy, as we find in the Neoplatonist 
interpretation of Homer's uh, Odyssey, we discover with Hesiod that the Cyclop was not a being with one eye originally. He was a being originally seeing in all directions. That was the meaning of his name. And I suppose the Greeks, trying to figure out how an individual could see in all directions, finally concluded that he must have one eye in the center of his head as being the only possible way of answering it. And in the due course, naturally, the eye in the center of the head moved into the center of the face, although that was not where it was originally intended to be. The Cyclop uh, is also a psychological entity, according to Iamblichus in his dissertation on the mysteries. For the Cyclop represents that part of the human consciousness which cannot be captured by the illusion of time and space. It is that part of man that regardless of how many mistakes he makes, always sees in all directions. The problem then remains to clarify this, to fulfill the psychological uh, fact that every individual knows, only, only a few persons know that they know. Locked within each individual <coughs> is all the perspective <coughs> or power necessary for his own orientation. In addition to the Cyclopes and uh, the Titans, there were also many armed beings and giants at that time. The many armed signifying the many activities of principles in their motions. All of these beings, according to the Greek legend, were invisible. They were not down upon our earth at all, but in an intangible psychic atmosphere. And it was here that the great primordial struggles between the orders of life took place. It was here also that later the powers of the Titans, or the twelve primordial energies of space, came to be gradually organized into a series of twelve, so dodecahedrons, as Pythagoras called them, which in ultimate form became consistently the number of the gods. So from the twelve Titans we naturally have the twelve Olympian deities who were drawn by a curious cross from several levels and orders of life. We also pointed out that by descent we had the uh, gradual emergence of Zeus or Jupiter as the lord of the gods that he had violently taken the kingdom of Cronus his father, who in turn had violently seized the throne of Uranus, or Uranus, his father, who in turn had violently built up his empire in the primordial substance of space. Later, uh, there would descend from Zeus a series of further deities like Dionysus Bacchus Zagros and a cycle of lesser divinities that were to gradually descend all the way until they became the nymphs and Uri and all <coughs> of the deities of forests and streams and mountains. Now Zeus stands as a very interesting personality in the Greek mythology. We must try to orient him. He is the third person of a great triad. And we told you last week that all Greek mythology breaks down into these triads, of which the first person is always called the father, the second is called the power, and the third is called the mind. So every triad consists of a father, a power, and a mind. And these are referred to as the great fountains in the Chaldean oracles of the Zoroasters. Zeus, therefore, in the triad that we are now considering, represents the mind of a triad. He also signifies the apex, or the upper part of the mundane world. Zeus, who perhaps is among the least of the beings of heaven, is by contrast among the greatest of the beings of nature. For he represents a point of median ground between 
heaven and earth, between God and nature, between Uranus and Gia, who are to produce between them or spin between them the web of existence. Now we know that Zeus was able to escape with the aid of his mother from the effort of Cronus to swallow him and destroy him, and that he so escaped by having a stone put in his place. Also that he was the sixth child that Cronus would have destroyed. The six is, of course, the symbol of the directions and of labor. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Therefore, the six has always been symbolical of a process or cycle of creating procedures. How was it, therefore, that Zeus was able to escape being devoured? And the stone which was put in his place was not detected so that later Zeus surviving was also able to restore the other deities that Cronus had devoured earlier. And from these deities uh, another sequence of interesting myths and legends descend. For our purpose, Zeus or Jupiter therefore is the only child of the gods that survived Cronus at that time. Therefore, he must represent a principle in nature that survives time over which Cronus has dominion and control. Zeus or Jupiter is therefore the victor over time. He is able not only to be victorious over time, but to usurp it, take it over, place himself upon the throne of the fates occupied by time, and become the ruler of the world. Now what is this power that can overcome time? And the Greeks themselves, analyzing the situation, uh, took the attitude that it is something which we call, although they did not have the word, we call consciousness. For consciousness alone is greater than time. Consciousness is the only thing that can survive time. Consciousness is the only thing which can attain to the realization of immortality and destroy the final power of time to destroy. So to the Greeks, Jupiter or Zeus represented the last of the children of heaven and earth and represented also the principle of the power of consciousness placed in the middle ground or a middle diffusion between the above and the below and by virtue of its own peculiar nature the predestined and foreordained ruler of the world all things must ultimately come under the control of consciousness Zeus having attained to this unique position also presents us with a series of other very interesting Dramatic, dramatic elements. Zeus stands at the apex of a kind of pyramid of, asc of ascending powers. These powers are ascending from nature by steps are generally affirmed to represent the body, mind, and soul of man and nature. Therefore, there is this order of ascending things growing out of the earth, the earthborn. And there is an order of descending powers coming down from heaven or from the sky, spiritual energies or agencies. And in the consciousness level of egoic selfhood, the Greeks believed that the divine and natural met. Uh, met. Therefore, that man was truly a progeny of heaven and earth, occupying a middle distance and achieving to sovereignty over both extremes or opposites. Zeus having thus represented a certain power, we can parallel him for simple and useful purposes <coughs> with a counterpart who occupies almost identically the same relation. And that is in the Valsung saga, 
or the Sigurd Saga. We have Odin, the great deity, ruling over the great palace of Asgard, surrounded by his twelve aces, or deities, the same as the Olympian family, and Zeus, and Zeus or Wotan, or Odin, all represent this immortal mortal, all represent this mysterious power uh, which alone is capable by consciousness of becoming the ruler of things. Consciousness, however, both in the Greek and in the Nordic legendary, has one limitation, and that is that consciousness can solve every mystery but itself. It cannot solve the mystery of its own nature. It cannot solve the mystery of its own origin or the mystery of its own destiny. As a result of that, Odin, of course, hung himself or was crucified upon the Yggdrasil tree in the effort to learn the mystery of his own destiny. This being deprived and denied him, he descended to the roots of the tree and cast his eye into Mirva's pool in search also of the secret of his own destiny. This again was not sufficient. He finally called upon the norms, the fates, they could not tell him. So he invoked Erda, the Earth Mother, and she would not tell him. No matter how he turned, Odin could never discover the mystery of his own destiny. And it is the same concept, perhaps, that we have in connection with human consciousness, which is capable of defining everything except itself, studying the destiny of everything except its own nature, and sealing the doom of everything, but unable to distinguish the boundaries of itself. In any event, this was the Greek thinking at that stage, and gave us this grand, magnificent, erratic, forlorn despot, Zeus. In the midst of all his grandeur, uh, was unable to escape the mystery of his own destiny and the equally mysterious and amazing problem of his nagging wife. These things even the gods were not able to conquer. The Greeks had a sense of humor in these matters and a very shrewd observation of the psychological elements of human nature. On Thessaly, in a comparatively deserted region, stood Mount Olympus, and here was convened the great council of the gods. In very early times, it is possible that the Greeks actually believed that there was some kind of a meeting of immortals on the top of the Olympian peak, which to them certainly was a grand, inspiring, snow-clad mountain. But with the passing of time, many men climbed Olympus and knew perfectly well that it was not a physical mountain that was to be considered the abode of the gods. So following Hesiod and thinking in terms of the Elder Ada of the Nordic peoples, we could get a certain vision of the world as it was. When the time came, for the diffusion of the natural world to take place within the under hemisphere of the great egg. This great under hemisphere was filled with a strange power which was itself a god. And this power was one of the titans. And this power was called Oceanus. And this was the one titan that played an isolated game. He refused to join with the other deities in any of their conspiracies against anybody. He was alone and remote and separate. And he dwelled in space and his name was Ocean. And it was upon the surface of Ocean and in the midst of Ocean that the first land, the first part of the physical nature of things came into existence. The Greek legends do not tell us how this happened. But perhaps we can learn the same idea from the Nihonji of the Japanese, which is their great national epic, or the Kojiki. Here we find the gods leaning over the edge of a bridge, dipping their spear points into the waters of eternity. They lifted the spear points out of the waters, and the mud clinging to the bottom of the spear points 
falling back upon the waters of eternity resulted in the coming of the islands, which naturally were going to be Japan, which, this being a Japanese story, was the first, best, and only important land created for a very long while. But the Greek myth could well have begun in about the same manner, although Hesiod does not give us the details. But we do know that in the midst of ocean, as in a constant and ancient guardian, the earth appeared. That the earth was flat, according to their thinking, and it was turned up at the outer edge like a dinner plate, so that the waters would not uh, fall over the edge into the world itself. And in the midst of this world, as in the midst of the Midgard, or Midgard world of the Nordics, rose the great mountain Olympus, which was the Axle Mountain, that went all the way up to the sky. And on this Axle Mountain was the abode of the deities, particularly the great throne of Zeus, where he sat in wonder and majesty over the entire mystery of creation. It was Solon later who studied this problem, discovered what he considered to be the cause of earthquakes, namely that someone had caused the boat of the earth to rock in the sea of ocean. And many ancient uh, scientific principles were built upon this concept. The Neoplatonists tell us that the Titan Ocean was equivalent to our concept not of water but of ether. And we have the same in the story of and the anal analysis of Anaximander and Anaximedes in their effort to discover the primary elements of things, fighting over the elements of fire and water as being primordial in the creation of the universe. The water of life, however, the great water of these sacred books of all people seems to have been this water ocean, the Shemayim of the ancient Hebrew Kabbalists. And this was the living water, the water of life, the water of energy, the field of ether, the mysterious Aquarian fluid of Canopus, the water of electricity represented by the Egyptian glyph, which we use now in astrology as the sign of Aquarius. This symbolism implied not just water, but a great humid field, a great supporting humidity of energy by which all things were nourished and supported. Our common water or fluid belonged rather to Poseidon or Neptune. But the great god ocean was the root of waters, the principle of waters, the divine power of nutrition that was within the energy of the great humid world around us. So we have the worlds floating upon the surface of ocean as upon the great surface of space. We have the planets moving around it in the great sea of ocean. We also have the mountain of the gods rising in the midst, ascending to the great heights and peaks where the Olympian concourse met and carried on its uh, various judicial and uh, governmental procedures. The next point that I think we should mention in connection with this is that in the development of the great circle of the basic Greek deities, a situation arose which was not dissimilar to that again which we have in the Nordic and Germanic religions. Namely that this twelves or circle was composed of deities of more than one origin. These deities, some apparently of greater significance than others, constitute an attempt to tell us the origins of these different divinities that were later to be united into one concept. And out of these origins we learn that there were three primary and important origins of the greater deities of the Greeks. <coughs> the first origin was the Titanic, the older gods, the very ancient and believed ones, coming from the dim dawn of pre-Hellenic culture. These were the highest and most ancient, but in the course of time their places were taken over by more brilliant and more recent divinities and they were pushed backward 
until they became honored, honored and venerated, but had to share their honors with the newer gods of new peoples rising up and achieving their political and spiritual destinies. <coughs> the second order of deities were those which descended directly from Zeus or belonged to his own order of life. They might therefore be called the direct uh, progeny of Zeus, either with others of his own order, the Titans, or with his other uh, levels of divinities arising out of the union of other Titans and belonging therefore to the Titanic order. <coughs> the third order arose from Zeus and the other deities uh, deriving through relationship progeny from lower orders of beings as from nymphs or from mortals. The union of the deities and mortals generally resulting in the generation of heroes or divinely anointed beings in whose natures were both divine and human qualities. Almost all of your savior gods, whether of Greece or any other group, arise in this latter order, nearly always being a union of divine and mortal elements. In the case, for instance, of Zeus, the great, the great savior divinity of the Greeks, Dionysus, was the result of the union of Jupiter or Zeus, the, de the deity, and a mortal woman, Semele. This, and in turn, is found in other religious systems. So we may affirm that there were three orders, those who came from the ancient gods, those who came from a median group, the level of Zeus himself, those who came through the union of the uh, Olympian deities with mortals or semi-mortal creatures. Nearly always these semi-mortal creatures ultimately attained to heaven, were picked up to become constellations, and their legends have become the great folk hero tales of uh, Greek and other mythologies. Now we have approaching us this problem of a cycle of twelve powers. We have to analyze this a little bit, uh, not only from the standpoint of mythology, but in an effort to, to grasp its possible meaning to us today. <coughs> we must have certain modern understanding of this. The ancients recognized, of course, a twelve-fold system of the universe. This system they tied to the zodiac. And they therefore recognized twelve kinds or aspects of the divine power of God. These twelve aspects or attributes were deified and therefore became twelve lesser gods existing in the nature of the one greater God. The one greater God enclosed these twelve. They were the parts and members of himself or itself. <coughs> but for practical purposes they became individual divinities. In this case we have therefore a list or order of deities which gradually came to take over the thinking of the Greeks and became the elements or letters of a kind of alphabet telling us the energies and powers <coughs> resident <coughs> in the divine nature. Now I had something on this on the board and somebody disposed of it. So we'll start it and for those of you who are interested we will just work on it from here. There's no particular need to go on to the board. But I can give you the essential elements which perhaps you would like to make note of in order that you may have a record of this particular problem. Now in the Olympian group of twelve the deities <coughs> that are taken uh, include certain of the titans and certain divinities that are not titans. And they may be called, therefore, for all presence and purposes, uh, that the superior group of these deities were all the children of Cronus and Rhea. Cronus being time in its most common uh, understanding, and Rias representing place or condition. 
receptive to time <coughs> and being a kind of space mother. From the union, therefore, of Cronus and Rhea were actually born twelve powers, six male and six female, becoming what might be termed polarities. But our present concern is only with those who entered into the Olympian compact or became united in the great Olympic bond. And this bond becomes important to us later because it has to do with the, the mystery rituals and the religious dramas of these people. So we have, as the children of Cronus and Rhea, who are enclosed in the Olympian group, the following. Jupiter and Juno, or Zeus and Hera. But for our simple purposes, I think the Latin terms are probably better known to most of us, so we'll give them the preference. Thus, Jupiter and Juno are brother and sister, and also husband and wife. This is later to become significant. The next of the Titans who becomes involved in this is Neptune, or Poseidon. Ceres, or Debita, who is the uh, goddess of the harvest, and Vesta, who is the symbol of purity, and from whom are termed the Vestal Virgins of Rome, are said to have originated. So of the ancient ones, there were five titans that formed part of the great Olympian dodecahedron. Jupiter, Juno, Neptune, Ceres, and Vesta. These belong to the old gods, to the deities that had a great and ancient tradition and have been remembered out of the dawn of the Greek way of life. Then the Olympian family was blessed with two deities that were the direct progeny of the union of Jupiter and Juno. And these two were Mars and Vulcan. Mars, of course, we all recognize as the deity of war. Vulcan was the spirit behind the volcanic action of nature and is supposed to have had his forges under Mount Etna. He is the one who made the armaments and shields, weapons and helmets of the gods and also did a little general uh, metallurgical research on the side. He had quite a part to play in the story. Now, by other means, <coughs> which will become part of the great scandal of Olympus, uh, there are certain other deities were introduced into this situation, resulting from the union of Jupiter with nymphs, mortals, and other beings that do not belong to the original order. And from these, the most familiar are Apollo, Diana, Venus, and Mercury. Now that leaves out only one that re represents and stands to the peculiar virtue of Jupiter and about which we are assured that could no scandal be possible. And that was the twelfth divinity, uh, Pallas Athena, or Minerva, who was born out of the head of Zeus himself without union with any other person. Now these legends, of course, either have to mean something or else they are a shocking waste of time. But the more we study them, the more we realize that they must mean something. The structure is too intricate and goes on into too many devious passageways to be meaningless in itself. Thus we have a, a little order of deities here, which uh, perhaps do not uh, form in any particular pattern. Well, look who's with us. Well, you can put that there for my ambrosia until a little later. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, here is our uh, cast of characters for this phase of the drama. And we might say that the Greeks themselves at an early time attempted to associate the, this cast with the Zodiac. But their associations between these two levels of thinking were never completely clear or consistent. And there are at least a dozen different systems of these analogies available. 
Therefore, we only say that this is typical of the arrangement that was made to identify the twelve deities with the great machinery of the astrochemical development of nature. So we have the following little cast of characters, uh, as we have already listed them. This is more or less a summary. We're bringing it into a picture. First of all, Jupiter, associated with the sign of Sagittarius, descended from Cronus and Rhea, the Titans. Secondly, Juno, associated with the sign of Libra, descended also from uh, Cronus and Rhea, and likewise the mother of Mars and Vulcan. This gets to be a little complicated, quite a family tree here before we get through with it. Third one on our list, Neptune or Poseidon. Neptune was the son also of Cronus and Rhea the Titan, and he is associated with the sign of the fishes, Pisces. The next deity is Ceres or Cori, the daughter of Cronus and Rhea, both Titans, and connected closely with the idea of the storing and preserving of the harvest through winter, and with tithing and the setting aside of the gift of the grain. She has to do with uh, the death and resurrection of plant life, and therefore the ancients, sometimes at least, associated her with Capricorn. Apollo is associated with Leo. He is a son of Jupiter. Vulcan, about the Diana, uh, the goddess of the moon, was the twin sister of Apollo, a daughter of Jupiter, and her symbol was the sign of Cancer. Vulcan was also the son of Jupiter and Juno and this sign was associated with Scorpio. Minerva was the daughter of Jupiter without a mother, born from his own mind, like Brunhilde, his thought daughter, who carried on, as in the Nordic legends, the Brunhilde myth, carried on always the secret thoughts of her father. He, she was associated with the sign of Aquarius, the next was Mars, or Ars, the son of Jupiter and Juno, and associated with the sign of Aries. Then Venus, who was the daughter of Jupiter, who is associated with the sign of Taurus, and according to Hesiod there were two forms of this divinity, one of which was very ancient and was the daughter of Uranus, or heaven. She is naturally associated with beauty and uh, with art, music, and things of that nature, and only later with amatory interests. Mercury was a son of Jupiter. He is associated with the sign of Gemini, and he was the messenger of the gods, the chronicler and scribe, and the patron deity of Thebes. The last is Vesta, a child of Cronus and Rhea, the Titans, and therefore descending from what Thomas Taylor calls the Titanic monad. And she, Vesta, was the symbol of purity, of chastity, of protection, and of all of the best and noblest aspects of the home, and dedication, and the religious life, and she was under the rulership or was associated with the sign of Virgo, being the Vestal Virgin. Now this gives us the cast of characters in this circle. And we know that as soon as this cast was developed, that the theological pattern moved almost instantly into the astronomical. And from this point on, the deities and their uh, related forces began to cause the emergence or coming forth of nature, the creation of the world. And in the creation of the world, uh, we find a series 
of very interesting legends or myths, one of which involves another titan who was a progeny of Cronus and Rhea, and that was the titan Prometheus. Prometheus, therefore, belonged to the old order of gods. He is the one who uh, attempted to bring the fire to earth and was punished by Zeus uh, by being bound to the peak of Mount Caucasus with the vulture gnawing upon his liver. And it remained for one of the heroes born of the Olympian deity and the mortal, Hercules, to rescue Prometheus from this long punishment. So among your heroes, you have beings of the order of Achilles, Hercules, Odysseus, born of deities and mortals. And you also have the demigodlets, such as Dionysius and Bacchus, who became closely identified with the mystery of salvation. Now the Greeks, we shall say, did they actually believe in these, in these deities literally? I think they believed in them in this sense of the word, that they recognized that it was possible to divide the activities of nature, that nature was not simply one force moving in upon the individual. It was an order of forces operating in various ways that there were rules governing almost every aspect of human life and human conduct. That there was justice and there was forgiveness, that there was strength, that there was wisdom, there was beauty, there was faith, there was love. All of these terms seem to imply a certain division within the substance of causal nature. It never occurred to the Greeks to assume that a principle could exist as an active agent without having a nature of some kind. Thus, when we think of the principle of wisdom, the Greeks could not divide this principle entirely from the idea of a titanic monad or being in whose nature wisdom was peculiarly exemplified. Or, if we wish to use the Chaldean term, the Greeks believed that all of a quality arose from a common fountain of that quality. Therefore, that love was not something that had innumerable separate existences. Love was one force flowing from the fountains of universal love. That this one force manifested in innumerable ways or might be completely concealed from manifestation, like a subterranean stream, but it still had one nature in itself. This nature was the nature of a principle, operating forever according to laws immutable and inevitable within itself. For this reason, these principles were referred to as gods. Over these principles ruled the sovereignty of Zeus. Zeus who carried with him the symbols of the thunderbolts, the power, the thunderer, the earth shaker. Now we do not know that Zeus was particularly good or particularly bad. Many of the legends about him would indicate that he had certain derelictions. Largely, however, even in the Greek myths, the grand program of his purpose is good. He is essentially seeking to reward the just and punish the unjust. And if he makes mistakes, he pays for them, like all of the mortals that surround him in nature. But the essential principle of Zeus is good. The principle of a deity ruling by the sovereignty of destiny the sovereignty of possessing consciousness, and therefore, as the fountain of <coughs> conscious existence, foredestined and predestined to be the governor of all things. Therefore, as the Emperor Julian says, 
one Zeus, one Son, one Spirit, our great Lord Jupiter. Thus, uh, we have in this concept the idea that Spirit, as we know it, is also one being that we are not divided spiritually but by appearance only and that the farther fountains of our spiritual existence constitutes the nature of Zeus or Jupiter which is the nature of the self seeking to know the eternal uh, searcher after realities the governor who rules with a certain strange uncertainty this immortal mortal uh, that can never completely solve the mystery of itself but is given the power to solve the mystery of everything outside of itself. From this type of thinking we can also go to Juno or Hela who is recalled or spoken of as the protectress of the home. And naturally she is the one who is most unhappy when Zeus became, comes a little callous in his personal relations with gods, goddesses, and the like. But uh, Juno is forever demanding that the great laws of the home be preserved and protected. She represents, therefore, the strange power of inevitable culture moving inevitably to the preservation of the good it thinks. She demands payment whenever the laws of human relationship on moral levels are violated. And although these laws be violated by gods, the punishment is the same, even by a god. The Greeks had one rather democratic thought about their way of, of philosophy, namely that their deities were never impervious to the consequences of their own misdeeds. The deity was not a privileged being. It was privileged to lead because it possessed certain powers of leadership. But in all its weaknesses, it was punished for these weaknesses. And in this punishment, we find the uh, ancient pattern of society rather carefully maintained. Among the other deities that come into our consideration, therefore, we should consider the monads or principles or powers represented by the twelve laws that the Greeks had perceived or had dimly sensed to be somewhere within the nature of things. Over the physical life and light of nature uh, they placed the power of the sun. They made Apollo the common sign of light and they placed in Apollo the conflict between light and darkness in all of its forms. Therefore, while it was a solar deity, it was also the symbol of a strange polarized nature. For in the case of Apollo, we had this deity under the law of day and night, under the law of darkness and light. We also had Apollo as the slayer of Python and the uh, Pythian oracles at uh, Delphi in which the god Apollo spoke in an oracular manner in hexameter verse through his entranced priestess. Apollo was therefore more than merely a sun god. He was also a god of harmony, usually the leader of the muses and represented quite often seated playing upon a lute surrounded by the attendant muses that form uh, the ceremonial body attached to his own nature. The muses also have their parts to play in things because the muses represent the breaking up or interpretation of these arch instincts into their various specified attributes. Apollo then as a principle of light and as the potent of harmony has to present both the unbalance arising from conflict as in the case of overcoming uh, the Pythian uh, serpent but he also has to be the reconciler and coordinator of all differences and confusions thus the Greeks give him the triple title 
of light keeper. He is not only the visible light carried across the sky in his chariot, he is the invisible light. He is not only the most brilliant thing seen to man, but he keeps the light of Olympus. Without him, the Olympian gods would be in darkness also, which means that consciousness, intellect, and the soul's powers, the vivific forces of nature, are also dependent upon Apollo and the apolitical nature over which he presides. Therefore, light symbolizes the inevitable search for light. It symbolizes truth as being the light of the inner life, it means the importance of man's internal uh, development of the power to see and to know and to overcome the darkness of nature and matter. If therefore we are to understand the principle over which uh, Apollo leads, we can say that he is the leader of the, of the urge or the pressure that draws men to the light. He is the peculiar custodian of truth, the search for which is perhaps man's greatest adventure, regardless of what he calls the various processes of living. He is uh, therefore a kind of psychopompus of the mysteries, and plays a very important part in almost all of the rituals. In coming to the deity Ars or Mars, we come into the presence, not necessarily, of a war deity, although in the course of time uh, the war principle began to develop. But namely that in Mars is the potential father fountain of activity, the dynamic, the pressing on, the forcefulness of human character. Consciousness represented by Zeus, becoming dynamic, takes upon itself the appearance of Mars, and in the form of Mars it pursues a certain course and purpose. <clears throat> in other words, it aspires or achieves to ambition. It directs itself to the fulfillment of a particular task by means of the expenditure of energy. Mars therefore represents the struggle, the striving, of consciousness to attain dominance over ignorance. It is the battle between uh, the unknown and the truth seeker. It is also the struggle between the inadequacy in the individual and the ultimate goal. It perhaps is a little reminding of the rather contradictory concept of the old Christian here, onward Christian soldiers. The idea of the servants of Christ being soldiers is not exactly in the pure spirit of Christian pacifism, but it still represents the idea that the attainment of the Christian purpose must be by a dynamic. The individual must be a dedicated soldier in the sense that he is part of a body of persons consecrated to the overcoming of evil and the victory of good over evil. It is a kind of crusade, and this crusade of life is under the control of Mars. And when this crusade becomes unbalanced or destructive, we then find Mars emerging as a combative principle. The deity Vesta has always seemed to me to be particularly interesting because she represents not only uh, the idea of spiritual virginity, but she goes into the true meaning of that inasmuch as it represents the old priestess veiled with her ancient garment of wool, uh, seated in an aloof place, entirely absorbed in her own internal meditation. Vesta, therefore, represents the internal life. It represents the individual departing not only from the corruption of the world, but from the worldliness of the world. Perhaps religious orders, of which the Vestal Virgins were one of the earliest to be recorded, this retreat away from worldliness was only a symbol of the search for esoteric integration within the self. It was the person in the quiet contemplation of their own divinity. 
It was the individual seeking to attain union with truth. Therefore, Vesta represents the secret ways of things, where through by purity, renunciation, discipline, and detachment, the consciousness is freed from the limitations of error and remains strangely calm, strangely aloof, strangely impersonal, and therefore is able to escape from error. This, I think, is uh, one of the reasons why this deity is so associated in the mystery cults of the ancient Greeks and Romans. Now we have also <coughs> one of our best known deities, and that is Mercury or Hermes. Mercury or Hermes was the communicator. Uh, in some mysterious way, the revelation of man's fountains of potential finally bring us into the direct presence of the sensory perceptions. And over these perceptions rules the power, by means of which all sensory perceptions take from a common fountain or source. There is only one visual energy in nature, regardless of who sees or how much they see. There is one only auditory power in nature. And in certain creatures, this power produces the auditory phenomena. In others, it does not. But there is only one seeing, one hearing, one tasting, one touching. All of these are aspects of a common energy. And this common energy was Mercury or Hermes. For this reason, and because of man's dependence upon the sensory perceptions which he possesses, for what he terms knowledge, education, enlightenment, or the advancement of his cultural destiny. Uh, Hermes was the instructor, the teacher, the messenger of the gods, the communicator between heaven and earth, and in Egypt under the name of Thoth, the, de the great scribe, or the keeper of all records, supposedly to have been the author of thousands of books, for the reason that the principle gained through observation and reflection over which Mercury rules became in substance the author of all books. All things of an intellectual sensory nature arise from Mercury, which also bears down upon us with the impulse to communicate, so that if we become too loquacious or too easily desirous of sharing either our knowledge or our ignorance, we do so by virtue of the Mercurial Principle. This tendency to communicate, to share, to seek to escape from isolation into a common comradeship of purposes. All these problems and pressures the Greeks recognized and personified under the nature of the deity Mercury or Hermes. Uh, this deity was also uh, regarded as the god of Thebes which is not particularly remarkable, for is not ingenuity the basis of thievery? Is not our knowledge the thing that is making us today perhaps the most corrupt of all peoples? We wonder if that is uh, an exaggeration, but after all we know that more of our knowledge is used to advance selfish purposes, perhaps at the expense of each other, than is actually expended for common good. Therefore it is not impossible to conceive that Mercury, by making man smart, also makes it possible for him to be uh, dishonest with a greater measure of efficiency and with greater thoroughness and more profit to himself and greater loss to his victim. In any event, uh, not only in the ancient times but as late as the Middle Ages, Mercury was worshipped as a deity of thieves and also as the messenger of the gods. The next principle that perhaps we should uh, give a pause to is our old friend Vulcan. Now Vulcan was the smithy, the tubal king of the ancient Greek pantheon. He was the god of the subterranean fires and things. He was the keeper of the smoldering pressures. And I think that it perhaps would be as well as anything else to suggest that under the heading of Vulcan, we now list those subconscious instincts which more or less occupy our own underworld, 
which break forward in or into our objective through the great combustions of our emotions, as in our complexes, frustrations, and neuroses. And that by means of these frustrations and by means of the volcanic principle, these pressures create armament and defensive weapons to protect or to arm the various attitudes and principles that we hold on to. So that actually this subconscious is forever arming our objective life against honesty or against the solution of the problems created by the subconscious itself. If it only produces an excuse, there is very little difference between an ex excuse and a good shield because they actually represent defensive armament. Anything but admit the fact. Escape or evade. Or perhaps build subconsciously such heavy patterns of tension and pressure that we can no longer discover our own natures. In any event, not only was Vulcan drawn into these kind of problems, but he also acted as a kind of smithy for the gods. He was the one that was called in on a number of occasions where tasks of unusual nature were required. He likewise had to do with the release of the powers of nature, the secret or hidden powers of nature. And it is quite possible that under Vulcan likewise would belong the entire theory of atomics because he was the keeper of the secret powers and he is the one who made the thunderbolts for Zeus. He pr provided these thunderbolts and remembering that all of these deities representing embodiments by law, if Zeus or consciousness orders the thunderbolts, then Vulcan or the natural machinery of life must produce them. Because all of these deities must obey Zeus because he is the consciousness by means of which they can fulfill his duties. And as he is consciousness, they have nothing with which to resist him. But if he demands of them that which is unreasonable, he then may cast himself into Tartarus for ages to come. But Vulcan indicates there is a tremendous combustion available which the gods use for various purposes and bring a terrible penalty if those purposes be wrong. Now we hear much of the moon deity, Chase Diana, the great mother of the Ephesians. She was the lunar symbol and principle, and she was called the goddess of the hunt. The moon and the imagination have always been curiously and wonderfully uh, related together. The moon represents a certain part of man's psychic field. It represents uh, the entire sister of imagination. The moon is the imager. Imagination is this peculiar metaphysical power which like some saucer of old waves a wand and the appearance of everything changes. Imagination is the very substance of the Midsummer Night's dream by which everything is a fantasy. Imagination places man in a world of fantasy. A world which can be a beautiful dream or a terrible dream according to his ability to direct the power of imagery within his own consciousness. Yet imagery has more to it than merely the self-deception or self-satisfaction. Imagination, whether we realize it or not, is the great power beyond progress and behind it. It is because only that we have imagination that we can ever exceed what we are now. Therefore, the lunar deity is forever exceeding itself. It is forever moving from the known toward the unknown through the visualization of imagination. And by believing all things to be possible, the moon makes many new things, not only to be possible, but to be actual. So the uh, goddess firing her uh, arrow at the stag reminds us also of the significance of the stag in alchemy. The stag or the mysterious unicorn which is almost identical with it, this timid creature that seeks forever to escape uh, the weapons of the nocturnal huntress who always hunts in the night 
for imagination cannot function where the light of fact is too bright. This capturing of the stag or the tying of the shawl around the unicorn's horn is imagination ever striving to grasp pure idea and also to become identical with the substance of intuition. Intuition is the creature that imagination hunts for. It is the science which imagination seeks to discover. But very often, instead of capturing it, it destroys it with its shaft. Diana the Huttress, her symbol in the human consciousness of man's constant visualization of things unknown, also presents a very clear picture of the understanding which the ancients possessed of many of these points. Now in the old legends and mysteries, Aphrodite or Venus was born out of the sea. According to the old legend of Hesiod, she was born out of the great sky ocean of Uranus. But out of other systems, she was the great child of ocean. And she emerged or came forth out of the sea in a magnificent seashell. The story of Venus and her, or Aphrodite, and her place in the great uh, study of philosophy is perhaps most clearly uh, summarized by Plotinus in his essay on the beautiful. Actually, Venus represents the principle of sheer and pure beauty. She is far deeper uh, than the later Romans with their rather uh, physical and literal inability uh, to detect abstract principles, rather, rather more than they could cope with, as far as interpretation is concerned. But according to Plotinus in his essay on the beautiful, all things, whatever uh, they may be, are ruled inevitably and eternally by proportion, by the irresistible instinct to be orderly, and by an equally insistent demand to be harmonic, to be gathered together in suitable arrangement, so that things which are by nature deformed or asymmetrical are displeasing to us as adventures of consciousness. Also colors which are inharmonious clash upon our sensitivities. Sounds which are discordant displease us. And within our natures we are forever mentally, emotionally, spiritually and morally seeking harmony, seeking beauty, seeking the realization that beauty on the level of conduct is morality. Beauty on the level of philosophy is ethics. Beauty on the level of religion is love. All of these principles uh, represent harmony, peace, concord, agreement, consanguinity, instead of division, discord, disruption, death. Man has instinctively realized that there is a peculiar divine nature and that therefore all things subsist according to beauty in one of its two forms. Now there are two forms as the Greeks pointed out. The ancient form of beauty born of heaven and the later form of beauty born of the sea as Aphrodite. The ancient form of beauty is cosmic concord or cosmic harmony the divine order of things. And in the manifestation from heaven itself into the great manifesting abyss of time, eternity moving into time and filling it, stands revealed as a supreme beauty, a perfect order, a mathematical, geometrical, harmonic relationship, symmetrical solids, all things in concord without dissonance or conflict among themselves. This was the ancient or primordial beauty. The secondary beauty born of ocean is that kind of beauty which is born of man's desire for goodness. Good is a kind of beauty. It is a little different in its essence and substance from truth which is a sovereign beauty. But man attempting to serve truth attempts to do so by conducting himself according to the good, 
Socrates decry, describes the great triad of the one, the beautiful, and the good. The one by which all things are created. The good by which all things are ultimately brought to fruition. And the beautiful by means of which heaven and earth are bound together. And by means of which all things in nature are redeemed. And that by beauty we shall understand the redeeming power of the gods. That all things shall be saved shall be made new again, shall be restored and rescued, and that beauty shall adorn itself with spring and come forth after the darkness of winter. Thus all good things, the virtues and graces of man's consciousness, all these things are said to be good and therefore to be beautiful. And the peculiar abstract archetype of beauty is one of the great fountains of space from which flow energies under total law, for the law of beauty is as absolute as the law of truth. There is no essential difference in their value, except that by beauty things are persuaded toward reality, and go toward reality joyfully in the great processionals of the mysteries. Thus beauty has a wonderful converting power, and the gods could not join with each other in the sumptuous repast of Olympus and share in their common duties unless beauty was among them. And the presence of beauty is therefore regarded as essential in all the meetings of the great instruments of state and wisdom. For without beauty there can be no true justice. Now we can pause again and study this most mysterious, controversial, and difficult of all, probably, of the Olympian deities, and that is Pallas Athena or as we call her more commonly, Minerva. Here is the hero goddess Bing. Here is the deity usually depicted in armor, helm, and bearing a spear, and also often with a shield upon which is the boss of the Gorgon's head. This divinity is a strange, almost androgyne creature, being or to some the goddess of wisdom, to others a goddess of war. Among her attributes were those of knowledge and the breaking of wild horses, so that it shows the strange diversity into which the attributes of this deity uh, are recognized. It is said that she was born from the head of Zeus, which broke open to permit her to come forth not only fully developed and full grown, but also wearing her armor and complete as she was to be. Therefore, she is to be understood as the mind-born, the one that is created by will or created by yoga, a creation which becomes practically the symbol of the yogic power of the Greek metaphysics. Minerva, therefore, is a secret art or power, a secret principle or energy, made available. And in all principle and substance, I think we may say that she was the embodiment or the personification of the concept of the sacred arts by means of which man became as a god, knowing good and evil. Thus she represents the presence eternally of the doctrine of the mysteries in the Greek way of life. She was the secret school of the wisdom religions. She but becomes a symbol also of the extrasensory perceptions of man by means of which this knowledge can be attained or known. Therefore, therefore you might say that as Duke University, Duke's University is believing in the existence of extrasensory perceptions and is trying to classify this phenomenon that the Greeks would say that if this phenomenon exists, it flows as part of an energy from one of the great sovereign fountains of space. If this is true, in other words, that there is an extrasensory perception, then this belongs to the whole mystery of existence. It is a power really and eternally present, locked within the mystery of things. And Diana, uh, representing imagination or intuition, uh, seeks in the lights and shadows of emotion uh, for this, whereas Minerva, strangely aloof, 
the symbol of wisdom and the guardian of the great city of Athens, which was regarded as the repository of the glory of Greece. She represents the divine patron of learning. She represents the mysterious armed power that fights in the sky for those that are right. She is peculiarly sympathetic and close to her father, for she is of his mind and substance, having been born without union with any conflict within her own nature. She is not the progeny of conflict. She is born there of a kind of immaculate conception, having no discord or division within herself. Minerva is therefore a very interesting and important symbol, representing the secret knowledge contained within the entire story of the Olympian deities. For she is the key to the cycle and everything that pertains to it. The indication that there is a meaning and a purpose behind this entire uh, pageantry of symbols. With her spear she reveals much. With her shield she protects light. With her helm she defends the source and heart of things. When Orpheus, the great bard of Thrace, is torn to pieces by the Cyclonian women in their orgy in the hills of Thessaly, his body was cast in many pieces into a river. But Minerva, sweeping down, took his head and carried it back to Olympus. Therefore, Minerva becomes, so to say, the defensive administrator of the will of Zeus. And also, when Dionysus, the beloved son of Zeus, was torn to pieces by the Titans, it was again Minerva who rescued his immortal part and took it back to heaven. Therefore, Minerva is forever the rescuer of the immortal parts of things, and may well be regarded as the esoteric or secret teaching by means of which the most precious or important parts of things are restored again to the spiritual fountains from which they came. Though we likewise have Ceres, or Devita, we said that she represented to a degree or in a way the harvests or the production and protection of life through grain and industry. To the ancient uh, Greek people, I think Ceres or Kori had a meaning, again, relating back to principles. And this principle was that of nutrition. In the great pattern of things, uh, it is the duty of Ceres to remind all things that they must be nourished according to their own natures. Now this is very important, as Taylor points out in his mystical dissertations. If we wish a thing that it shall grow, then we have a law in nature which says that it must grow according to its kind, according to its seasons, and according to its laws, that there must be the necessary seed for the future planting, Therefore, the rise of the idea of tithing, or the putting away of the 10% for the Lord, which symbolizes the putting away of the seed for the coming planting. So, uh, Ceres, representing this principle of nutrition, goes into the philosophy of the Greeks in a very interesting way, in your Socratic philosophy. For all things to have their nutrition must be fed of their own substances. If, therefore, man desires beauty, he must feed his beauty with beauty. If he desires wisdom, he must nourish his wisdom from the great fountains of wisdom. If he desires understanding, he must nourish the understanding within himself with a proper food or natural diet. One of the things, for instance, that Corey tells us is that there are no miracles in the nutrition of things that as the body must have those foods necessary to itself or perish, so the invisible and eternal life of man, including the gods who must have their, their uh, ambrosia and their nectar, must have a food suitable to their own natures. All things are developed by the strengthening of their own kinds, by the development and recognition of their own principles we achieve almost any end which we seek by becomingness, 
by developing within ourselves the similitude of that which we desire. If we wish to have a kindly nature, we must continually cultivate kindliness, nourish ourselves with our own kindly thoughts and actions, and become keenly aware of the value of kindness in our relation with others, and also in the interrelation of peoples of all types and kinds. If we desire to have peace of soul, we must feed peace with peace, for we cannot feed peace with a sword or with discord. And we cannot, as Pythagoras points out, achieve peace by scattering coals with a sword blade. Each thing must be according to its own kind. If we desire unity, we must nourish our lives upon the consciousness of unity. If we desire to dedicate our achievements to some great cause, we must nourish this dedication by action by consecration and by the continual restatement of our purpose within ourselves always. And that which we use to nourish us must be like to the thing which we wish to achieve, for we cannot become kindly by allowing ourselves to live on a diet of gossip. We cannot become gentle by allowing ourselves to continually receive into our natures destructive or unkindly sentiments and ideas. So. Uh, debita or series is the principle of the nourisher that all things must be nourished by the qualities which we desire them to reveal and that by continually keeping this rule or this law we shall achieve a great deal more for ourselves I just wanted to see whether it missed anybody in this pattern I don't think we have uh, the uh, points therefore that we want to make are, as Hesiod tells us, that these twelve deities are the fountains of powers. Now the Greeks were not, as I have said, entirely in agreement as to these powers or to their names. But the principle beneath their concept is always consistent and obvious. And that is that these powers represent like twelve great bowls or fountains flowing continually in the sky. Now in the Greek theology, for example, uh, the deities, the principal deities, are not in the center of the solar system, but in the circumference. Therefore, the great gods reside in the band of the zodiac, the great medial band of the ancient uh, Egyptian and Greek thinkers. And their forces flow downward and inward from the circumference to the center continuously. And in the midst of this entire field is the crater or cup into which all of their energies are finally mingled. And out of this cup, uh, cup arises the strange and fantastic form of the genii, or the genius of man, the symbol of the being in whose nature all natures are combined and mingled. For as uh, the uh, myth of Dionysus tells us, in man's nature is the blood of the gods and the ashes of the titans. Man as he stands today therefore epitomizes or receives into himself all of the mystery of the Olympian order, all of the strange cosmogony that has gone before, all the conflict and confusion of fable and legend, all the unfinished business of the ages is vested in man himself. To understand this is to rescue his own relationship with life. Man looking into himself has great difficulty in perceiving this. He looks into himself and he sees only mystery. As he looks into himself, he is not even able to be aware of his own in, in this. He is unable to be consciously uh, conscious of any root or source within his own nature. And because his objective faculties blaze forth out into phenomena, his numenal or internal causal nature is known only by mathematics, by statistics, by formulas, or by symbols. The ancients realizing this knew that man's greatest hope of discovering the innermost nature of his own being was to discover his relationship to the larger world, into which all the elements flowed which made up his own peculiar nature. So they gave us this elaborate creation myth which can move inside of man and become a symbol 
of his entire coordinating existence. According to Paracelsus, who was very wise in these things also, man is a constellation consisting of twelve orders of energy, that these orders of energy constitute the great magnetic field in which he functions, that these twelve orders of energies flow in the great field of his auric egg, which is his egg of Hades, and from which bursts also Hades, many-headed and many armed. The entire story can be taken into the psychological life of the human being. Uh, some time ago, uh, I was talking with quite an expert on the problems of certain psychological, biological phenomena, and they said that they felt quite certain that in the course of time, we would inevitably and uh, properly divide all mental aberration and psychological phenomena into twelve types. And these twelve types would all represent primarily, that is, negative psychological phenomena, would all represent abuses of primordial psychic energy. Well, if there are twelve ways in which primordial psychic energy can be abused, then these abuses would certainly be significant of the rebellion of the titans, and the fact that these primordial energies were turned against the gods, and at that time only one energy refused to move, out of refused to take part in the conspiracy, and that energy was ocean. That uh, remained patient under all the adversities of this conflict, so that the only energy which did not turn and become involved in this rebellion was the pure energy of energy itself, that is, the life principle, the principle of vitality. Everything else was corrupted, but it remained beyond corruption. And in the development of this corrupting power, the titans, turning against heaven and earth, launched their terrible war, for which they were ultimately destroyed. And out of the residue and refuse of this tremendous primordial conflict, there gradually emerged the second order of man. In this case, the second order being under the control of the Jupiterian monad, or the power of personal consciousness. Behind personal consciousness was the struggle of the subjective energies of space, as these struggled in the psychic field of man himself. And it was only after, therefore, the destruction of the titans, or the energies, which were gradually exhausted, or brought under control, that Zeus was able to achieve his victory over the titans, and to bind these rebel energies in the mysterious underworld. Now if we take by this underworld the symbol of the unconscious or subconscious life of man, we know that consciousness represented by will and action therefore becomes the conscious ruler of the world. But that against this conscious ruler is the eternal rebellion of the imprisoned titans in the underworld. And that if for any reason Zeus relinquishes the power of his thunderbolts and the power of his lightning, or loses the skill and keenness of his all-seeing eye, there will immediately be a con conflict. The titans will attempt to destroy, and may even endanger, the balance of the world. On one occasion, Zeus was confronted with a most unhappy situation. Eleven of his own deities rebelled against him. <clears throat> he was threatened with war in heaven. He then proceeded to take his thunderbolt and he stood upon the edge of his great throne and he told these deities that if they wished to do so, that they could all revolt and leave him alone, that they could go down into any parts of the world they wanted to and establish their own worlds, their own universes, and that he would then take the entire creation which they had fashioned, circle it with a golden chain, bind it to the pinnacle of Olympus, draw this chain back into heaven, and leave all the gods and godlings swinging in space between sky and earth. It was a big scene, you know. We're not sure that they ever put it on, but it was quite a big scene. But psychologically, here we have this situation. The titans are not dead. We know that. We know that the titanic, disordered forces of man's life are not dead that they are controlled by the power of consciousness and reason, that certain faculties 
and the ancient Hindus, recognizing twelve convolutions of the brain, relate these twelve centers with the twelve principal deities of their great circle of Mount Miru, that there are certain orderly deities or orderly process functions by means of which chaos is prevented from controlling the life of man, that even these faculties may rebel, and that constantly the gods must be alert, as in the case of the Nordic deities, lest the powers of darkness representing uh, the combustion of the titanic faction should break through the underworld and attempt to storm the earth and destroy heaven. Thus the Greeks seem to have a touch of the psychologist in them. They sense the constant danger of impulse, of negative, unconditioned, uncontrollable anger, passion, hate, fear. These things as primordial forces which have to gradually be brought into a civilized state. In other words, through the regeneration or redemption of the titanic powers. Gradually the good titans were reformed. But the struggle goes on still uh, to prevent the consciousness of man from being swallowed up in the abyss of chaos as a result of disordered factors taking control over the organized life of the human mind. Thus the psychological drama is certainly well exemplified and well indicated in the Greek story. Actually the gods do not seem to be very busy most of the time in the Olympian story. Someone asked the ancient fabulist Aesop what the gods did, and he said the principal activity of the deities was to lift up the small and to cast down the great. And this we see in history to be more or less uh, factual in the, in the development of our great social concepts. But actually the gods are not arbitrators or arbiters of anything. Representing energies, they simply fulfill their own natures. These energies are not moral or immoral. They are not good or bad. They are not more or less. These energies are simply the fountains of life potential by which all things exist and are sustained and move toward their various destinies. The Greeks did not believe in good and evil spirits as we do. They believed in nature in which various uses caused energies to be a, apparently good or bad but that an energy was an amoral thing, something that had its own ways, its own purposes, and its own uh, laws. To break the laws of an energy is to come under the retribution of that energy. To keep the laws of an energy means to have continually increasing participation in that energy. Therefore, through obedience, all things are attained. And the problem of balancing and integrating the forces of these patterns constituted the great secret of Greek religion and philosophy. Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle were well aware of the fact that man having twelve dynamic factors must bring them into order. He must not only use them, he must prevent them from injuring each other in the process of use. He must therefore bind his Olympian deities together in a one harmonious body of cooperating powers. And he does this by establishing the sovereignty of reason, by means of which he brings all other things into their proper relationships with each other. Philosophy is this coordinating factor. It is by philosophy that man learns how to unite variables and to bring them into enduring patterns of harmony and, really, and uh, mutual uh, reciprocity. It is only by philosophy, therefore, that the individual can learn the significance of intervals, intervals being the spaces between things, in this case qualitative intervals. Here we have intuition as a kind of quality. Against intuition we must balance judgment, another kind of quality. Against intuition and judgment we must triangulate uh, beauty, uh, the man's aesthetic uh, concept of life. These things must be discovered not to be contradictory in themselves, nor shall they frustrate one another, 
nor shall the service of one result in the neglect of the other. This means that man has to gradually balance all of these potentials until he lives in a pattern of their common harmonic cooperation. This was the Pythagorean and Platonic concept that these gods or powers had to come through in man into expression and that the perfect man, the integrated man, the safe citizen is the one in whom all functioning powers are so balanced that there can be no conflict within the nature itself. If there is no conflict within a nature, then the conflict between that nature and other natures is also reduced. But the end of the Olympian order as rising from the titanic chaos is that from the titanic chaos of ignorance, savagery, and the lack of self-control, man must elevate himself to the Olympian order of cooperation, mutual assistance, understanding, wisdom, knowledge, peace, beauty, and truth. By achieving this empire, this hierarchy of value within himself, the individual achieves the security which he needs for the active participation in his own daily affairs. The Greeks, however, were not the kind of people who would make a tremendous job out of this. The Greek was a happy man. He was not dedicated in the sense of being a martyr. He had no intention of sacrificing everything that was pleasant in life for the cultivation of abstract virtues. But what he tries to tell us, and perhaps he is far righter than we realize, is that the life of penance, the life of spiritual misery, the life of constant unhappiness about values is not a good life and not a life intended, that actually the harmony of these powers is inherent in themselves. Everywhere in space these powers do get along together, except in man. Therefore man is the battlefield between the titans and the gods, and it is here that the great Armageddon must be fought. That this conflict is not in nature, not in heaven, not in earth but in the imperfect nature of man himself. Therefore, that instead of fighting this conflict, the individual has merely to relax into a state of order. It is not that he must do certain things better than he is doing them, and other things he should not do. The key to the matter is that he should move directly and simply along the lines of the laws governing energy without self-deceit without permitting false values to distort him away from the natural honor with which he is endowed. The deities, therefore, will give him their protection and their power. The wisdom of Pallas Athena is his, and she fights in the sky above him, as long as he preserves the simple, direct search for wisdom, a search which is not for a particular wisdom, that one shall know more of this or more of that, but the kind of wisdom that has the instinctive ability to discover the beautiful and the good in all things. A natural, simple relaxation away from excess. When man no longer is a victim of excess, that which remains is moderation. And all of the heavenly mysteries are linked in moderation. For in moderation all things can be used but in excess all things damage each other. So the struggle for the Olympian order in man to the Greeks was the bringing of order in his thinking, in his living, in his relationships with others. And that through this Olympian order, as Plato points out, there will ultimately emerge the government of the world. For the government of the world is nothing more or less than universal government applied to the establishments of men. And until men reverence universal government in their own personal living, they will not support it in their community functions. So this pattern becomes the basis of all relationships and all laws. And next week we'll go on with some more of it, but it looks like the time is up for this evening. Thank you for listening to this lecture by Manley P. Hall. For more enlightening lectures like this one, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the bell so you can be the first to get notifications when the next video is ready. Also, 
you can encourage us to share this knowledge by liking and commenting this video, so we can reach more people around the world, and help them wake up too. Thank you and we'll see you in the next lecture.